Um, and I believe there are some common skin conditions as well that may alert people. Um, things like shingles. Um, okay, so, there's, so there's, there's indicator diseases where if you were in a place where there's lots of HIV, if you saw this disease, you'd think this person's got HIV and shingles would be one of those. Now, in, in the UK, um, there's quite a lot of shingles and it's not all associated with HIV, but if you saw someone with shingles, specifically if it was a young person, um, it would be advisable to do an HIV test. And also for less common things, so if you um, had a patient that presented with a, sh with a sore mouth mm. and you noted they had um, oral candidiasis, now that can be caused by diabetes, it can be caused by taking antibiotics, but it can also be caused by HIV. So an HIV test will be indicated in that person unless you were sure it was due to something else. Even um, things such as um, athlete's foot. I mean, athlete's foot is a fungal infection. It's very common. But if someone was getting recurrent athlete's foot, if it was much more extensive than, um, than, than you were normally used to seeing, again, an HIV test would be indicated. Yeah, and I think psoriasis is another one and bad seborrheic dermatitis and things yes, like that no, as well. Yes, certainly. Yeah. Okay, um, so y your feeling is really that we should be making HIV testing far more widespread um, in, the, in the UK? Yeah, d definitely. I mean, the HIV problem in the UK is not huge, but we, we, we're in a country where we have sufficient resources to treat anyone with HIV very well. And the earlier people can be known to have HIV, mm. that the better they're going to do. I mean, if you're diagnosed with HIV early, you may not necessarily need treatment straight away, but you can be monitored, and your treatment can be started at an optimal time. Mm. Now, it's, it's known in the UK from various surveys that up to a, a third of people who are walking around with HIV infection do not know their status. Right. And if those people are outside of being monitored, they can potentially present very late. Well, I mean, there's, there's, there's two problems. First of all, if they don't know the status, they won't be able to take precautions to prevent them infecting other people. Mm. And for their personal health, their disease may progress and lead on to a serious infection, which, which could kill them, mm. without them having had the advantage of HIV treatment. And it, it's fair to say that the later you're diagnosed with HIV, the more difficult it is to be treated successfully. Right, OK. A lot of people think that if a woman is HIV positive and she becomes pregnant, then the baby is always going to be HIV positive. Is that correct? No, it's not correct. I mean, fortunately, the HIV virus doesn't automatically pass to the fetus in a pregnant woman. And the majority of HIV transmission from mother to child occurs around the time of delivery. So during um, early pregnancy, the woman is not commonly passing HIV to the, to the baby. Now that has some advantages for prevention because you can target your prevention to around the time, to before, around the time of delivery and afterwards. So if, you, if, if a mother has been tested and found to be HIV positive, she can be offered antiretroviral therapy that will significantly reduce the chance of her passing the virus to the baby. Mm. Now the, the type of therapy she's offered will depend on and the stage of HIV infection she's, she has. If she has advanced HIV infection, she will need to start proper, fully suppressive antiretroviral therapy straight away. Mm -hmm. And that will be a benefit to her, and it will reduce the chances of HIV being passed to the, to the baby. If the woman is not at the stage where she needs antiretroviral therapy for herself, mm -hmm. she can be given a shorter course of antiretroviral therapy, which will reduce the amount of virus in her bloodstream, and again, significantly reduce the amount of um, the, the, the chance that the baby will acquire HIV. Mm. In, in South Africa, we were running at um, mother-to-child transmission rates of around 20%. So 20% of um, pregnant women were infecting their babies. This, this was before the introduction of, um, of methods to reduce that. Now, when um, antiretroviral therapy was introduced, and that was just a, a single dose of nevirapine, transmission rates dropped down to, to low single figures, probably around 5% or less. And um, also with offering mothers other feeding options because HIV can be transmitted to the baby through breastfeeding. So if you're able to offer the mother other feeding options, you can reduce transmission even further. Brilliant. And I believe in this country, in the UK now, all pregnant women are tested? Yes, it's part of routine antenatal testing and it's an opt-out system. So all women are 
tested for, for hepatitis B and for syphilis and also for HIV. And a, a woman will be tested unless she specifically says she doesn't want to be. Okay. I just want to ask you one or two more questions specifically. Um, what is the difference between HIV and AIDS? Okay. Well, HIV is a virus, the human immunodeficiency virus. It's a virus that you acquire that damages your immune system. AIDS is a condition, it's a syndrome, the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And it's a syndrome that is caused by the HIV virus. The HIV virus damages your immune system and the condition that that produces is called AIDS. Okay. Once somebody, a lot of people say, have I got full-blown AIDS, doctor? What would you say to them? Okay, well, look, I think, I think it's not a helpful description. I think it's um, a little bit sensationalist. Because when you catch HIV infection, immediately your immune system is being damaged. Now, the de degree of damage that the HIV causes depends on how long that HIV is left in your body untreated. Now, what, what patients may mean by full-blown AIDS is where they've had HIV for quite a long time, their immune system is very damaged, and they've acquired opportunistic infections. These are infections that people with intact immune systems don't get. So things people may have heard of are cryptococcal meningitis, which is a meningitis due to a fungus, um, toxoplasmosis, which is a parasite in the brain, and certain cancers such as Kaposi's sarcoma. So in the early days of the HIV infection, people that presented with those types of diseases were said to have AIDS because those things were indicative of the acquired um, immune deficiency syndrome. There's also um, an immunological definition which could be when your CD4 count, which the cells that fight HIV drop below 200. People may then say, look, this person's now got AIDS. But I think in, in the modern era, it's actually not a helpful description. I mean, HIV infection damages your immune system, and that damage must be stopped and limited with, with treatment. Brilliant. A couple of more questions, if I may. Can you catch HIV from kissing? OK. Well, no. no. I mean, it depends what you're doing with your kissing, but the answer to that basically is no. Do you, mean, can be... do you mean what depends what you are kissing, or <laughs> does it mean who you're kissing? Well, okay, so, so kissing mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, the chances of catching HIV are, are minuscule, uh, vanishingly small. Kissing, if that means oral sex, there is a risk of transmitting HIV, and safe oral sex practices should be, should be practiced by people if they're uncertain of the status of their partner. What do you mean by safe oral se sex? Okay, so if, if it was um, oral sex where someone was, um, as I say, sucking someone's penis, you'd want to cover that with a condom, and that would reduce the chance of, uh, of, of transmission of HIV. Also, if you were practicing oral sex on someone and you noticed that they had ulcers or an active STD, that probably wouldn't be a wise thing to do. Okay, so what is the most risky form of sex that you can do to catch HIV? Okay, well, all... Penetrative sex carries a risk. The most risky form of penetrative sex is, is um, receptive anal intercourse. What does that mean? That means where something is inserted into someone's anus, usually someone's penis into someone's anus. And is it more risky for the person that's putting it in, or is it more risky for the person that's having it put in? It's more risky for the person that's, that's having it put in. The person, the receptive partner, is the one that's at most risk. Some people say that it's all right if you don't come inside them. Is that true? No, that, 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 that's wrong, because HIV is present in all secretions. And when you're having sex, secretions are produced throughout the whole um, sexual act. So if you, if you insert um, your penis into someone's rectum, that the risk is from the start. OK. So are condoms, do they protect you from HIV? Yes, most, most certainly. If you were a person uh, watching this, uh, wondering whether or not you should go and have an HIV test, what would be your message? Well, I think if you're wondering about having an HIV test, if you're worried you may have been exposed to HIV in any way, you should have a test. Um, that, that would be the message. I mean, you can't know your HIV status until you've tested it. Okay, thanks.